हेलो एवरी वन एंड वेलकम बैक टू आर चैनल सो एज यूल ऑल अवेयर वी वेर डिस्कसिंग दी चैप्टर डायूरेटिक ड्रग्स दोज विच इंक्रीज द एक्सक्रीशन ऑफ सोडियम एंड अलॉन्ग विद इट वाटर फ्रॉम द बॉडी सो वी हैव सीन द रेलिवेंट फिजियोलॉजी इन द ट्रांसपोर्टेशन मेकेनिजम्स विच वी हैव सीन accordingly what are the different sites into which the nephron can be divided into also we have covered the classification the first class we have considered in detail that is the high ceiling diuretics also we have covered the medium efficacy diuretics which is the second class of these diuretic drugs and in today's video we shall consider the third class that is the weak diuretics or the adjunctive diuretics so under this class we have seen that there are three further sub classifications that is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors the second sub class is the potassium sparing diuretics and the third one is the osmotic diuretics okay so as we have already discussed in the introduction part these are the drugs that is there is the drugs belonging to the weak diuretic class they either have a weak diuretic action that is a little bit excretion of sodium may be uh, increased by these particular agents or these are better used as an adjunctive drug that is along with a more efficacious drug these can be combined okay so for certain specialized purpose like to prevent the loss of excessive potassium from the body which is the complication of the first two classes which we have seen so for that purpose potassium sparing diuretics are utilized so the drugs which are present in these this third class these either have a weak diuretic action or they serve a specialized purpose for which these are combined with the more efficacious drug so let us consider the first sub classification that is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors okay so this is the accepted short form for it c a capital c a s e okay carbonic anhydrase this is the uh, abbreviation for the enzyme so in the introduction we have also seen what is the significance of this particular enzyme if you can uh, remember this particular figure we had uh, focused in the relevant physiology of urine formation as well so what is the significance of this particular enzyme we have seen that two sub types are present the one which is present inside the proximal tubular cells so this is carbonic anhydrase 2 and the one which is present in the lumen and in the brush brush borders along the uh, apical membrane so that enzyme is carbonic anhydrase type 4 okay so wherever the location is it catalyzes a similar kind of reaction Okay, as you can see that over here in the lumen we have seen that hydrogen ions and the bicarbonate ions combine to form the carbonic acid. So this carbonic acid it is split into water and carbon dioxide within the lumen, and this carbon dioxide and water it gets reabsorbed inside the proximal tubular cells within which the carbonic anhydrase type two. will recombine these two to form the carbonic acid within the cell and this in turn will spontaneously split into h plus ion and bicarbonate ion okay so as a result of this what will happen the bicarbonate will be reabsorbed whatever bicarbonate was present in the filtrate it will get reabsorbed along with the sodium and the h plus ion which is generated it will be re secreted in exchange with the sodium ion so as we have seen earlier the anti porter which transports the two ions in the opposite direction that is sodium is moving into the cell and potassium is moving out of the cell with the help of this anti porter so unless and until each of the two ions move okay, this transporter will not be functioning okay so it it cannot transport only sodium ions leaving back the uh, sorry the hydrogen ions okay so for sodium to move in h plus has to move out so this is what we have seen so in turn what we can see what is the significance of this enzyme yes it functions in the carbon dioxide bicarbonate transport and also in the h plus ion 
secretion so imagine if this enzymes are not functional what will happen if this enzyme if it is not functional what will happen this carbonic acid it will not split into water and carbon dioxide so whatever bicarbonate is there it will get excreted out as it is imagine if this enzyme does not function what will happen carbonic acid within the cell will not be generated as a result of this h plus ions and bicarbonate ions will not be formed right it will not uh, lead to this further splitting reaction so h plus will not be exchanged for the sodium ions and bicarbonate again it will not be reabsorbed so this is the significance of this enzyme and let us see what is the location of this enzyme yes it is mainly present in the proximal tubular cells so it is present in the tubular cells elsewhere as well but uh, most probably it is present in the proximal tubular cells apart from that it is also located in the gastric mucosa exocrine pancreas pancreas it is, it is both exocrine as well as endocrine uh, gland right so the exocrine part of the pancreas it contains this enzyme so it has the function in the bicarbonate generation over there then in the ciliary body of the eyes as well and brain and the rbcs in the blood so these are the different locations at which this particular enzyme is present so quite a lot of enzyme is present throughout the body okay so inhibition of this enzyme it's quite a challenging task okay then coming to the example of the drug that is the acetazolamide okay so this drug it is a sulfonamide derivative actually which inhibits this particular enzyme in a non competitive manner and the inhibition is reversible in nature okay so once the drug is removed okay or it is withdrawn the enzyme it will regain its property of the catalyzing this particular reaction so it mainly inhibits this particular enzyme carbonic anhydrase 2 which is present inside the proximal tubular cells okay so as a result of inhibition of this enzyme what will happen this reaction which it catalyzes that is the hydration of the carbon dioxide for it to get converted into carbonic acid it will be inhibited so as a result of this what will happen up to the availability of h plus ion obviously the availability of h plus ions will also get decrease so when this h plus ion is not available for the action will sodium enter into the cell what did i tell you just now that for the sodium to enter inside the cell the h plus ion has to move out right this anti porter will function only when both these ions will move in the opposite direction okay so since the h plus is not available for getting excreted hence what will happen as a consequence sodium will also not move inside so as a result of this it will result in excretion of the sodium ions okay so this is how it will result in the diuretic action or natriuretic action now apart from that it can also inhibit the acetazolamide can also inhibit the type 4 enzyme as well so as a result of this the carbonic acid will not split into water and carbon dioxide so dehydration of this carbonic acid will be prevented so as a result of this this entry of carbon dioxide within the cell will be prevented right so all these further reactions will be prevented right so what will happen to the bicarbonate now will it get reabsorbed will it get will, will it reach over here carbon dioxide is not getting formed over here so this carbonic acid as it is it will get excreted out so carbonic acid it what it is carrying h plus ion as well as the bicarbonate so what will happen to the ph of the urine yes it will be alkaline in nature right so bicarbonate more and more bicarbonate is also getting excreted out okay so as a result of this the reabsorption of the bicarbonate in the proximal tubule is also getting affected so as a result alkaline diuresis will take place okay now coming to the 
action. So this is to do with the mechanism of action that inhibits the carbonyl anhydrase. So as the name implies of the class. Okay. Now coming to the actions. Now secretion of the H plus ion in these later parts is also inhibited. Okay. So what we have seen just now in proximal tubule that is at site to this particular enzyme within the proximal tubular cells will be inhibited. As a result of this, the reabsorption of your bicarbonate is prevented and the reabsorption of your sodium ions is also inhibited okay? because H plus is not available for the exchange. Now, the similar kind of effect is produced in the site 4 as well. Okay? Where is site 4? Yes, the site 4 it comprises of the DT and CD. Okay, distal convoluted tubules, later part of the distal convoluted tubules and the collecting ducts. Now over here actually the hydrogen is secreted. Okay, now here hydrogen is secreted, sodium is reabsorbed. But actually the transporter is not a sodium hydrogen antiporter but hydrogen gets secreted with the help of hydrogen ATPs. There is a separate transporter for H plus secretion. But how it is generated within the cells? Just now we have seen what is the mechanism? Yes, it is this reaction is catalyzed by the carbonic anhydrase of the generation of H plus which is getting secreted with the help of this transporter. Okay, so as a result of this, the secretion of H plus ions in the later parts is also inhibited. Okay, so over here what will happen now since carbonic anhydrase is given? H plus will not be exchanged with the sodium ion. So what will happen now as a result of this? Now there is one more mechanism by which the sodium will get exchanged, right? Sodium gets exchanged with the potassium ions, right? As we have seen in the later parts. So since H plus is not available with what the sodium will get reabsorbed? Is it that if you inhibit this transport, will the sodium not get absorbed? It will get absorbed, right? Because another ion is available for the exchange. So instead of now hydrogen, hydrogen is not available for exchange. So most of the sodium, it will get reabsorbed. And what it will get exchanged with? Yes, more and more potassium ions will get lost in the urine. So it will result in marked caliures, caliuresis. That is presence of your potassium in the urine. More and more potassium will get excreted out. Okay, so hypokalemia will be produced. That is de depletion of the potassiums may take place in the body because of the action of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Okay, so as we have seen under the mechanism that the urine which is produced, it is alkaline in nature, right? And what it is rich in? Which ion? Bicarbonate excretion is promoted, right? And along with it, sodium and Potassium excretion will also be promoted, right? Yes. Now, because of the continued action of this acetazolamide, if you continue the treatment with this particular drug, what will happen to your bicarbonate level of the body? Obviously, it is promoting the excretion of uh, the uh, sodium ions and along with it, it is also promoting the excretion of bicarbonate ions. So, will it not result in depletion of body uh, bicarbonate ions? So bicarbonate, it is an alkali which is moving out of the body. So as a result of this, it will result in acidosis okay? because the alkali is moving out. Now will your body keep quiet when alcohol, uh, acidosis is precipitated? No. Okay? So as a result of acidosis, the less amount of bicarbonate will be filtered at the glomerulus as a compensatory mechanism. Okay? Since acidosis is produced, since the bicarbonate is lost, the body acidity will increase. So your homeostasis in your body will come into picture and it will prevent the loss of bicarbonate from the body. Okay? Less of it will get filtered out over here. The filtration will be reduced. Okay? Now if the bicarbonate ion secretion is reduced, obviously what will happen? Yes, less of diuresis will occur. So what you can conclude from this? This particular diuretic, that is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, that is acetazolamide, it has a self-limiting diuretic action. Because of its action, compensatory mechanisms will come into picture and the 
diuretic effect will get subsided. Okay, so no doubt it will induce diuresis, alkaline diuresis initially, but as you continue the treatment, it will bring in compensatory mechanisms in such a way that the action of this drug is a self-limiting. Okay, so this these are the actions, these are the renal actions what we have seen. Now coming to the extra renal actions of this acetazolamide. Apart from the kidneys, what are the effects which are produced by the acetazolamide? Okay. So as we have seen under the glaucoma treatment, acetazolamide is used right, to reduce the intraocular tension. It lowers the intraocular tension by decreasing the formation of aqueous humor. So we have seen the role of carbonic anhydrase over there as well. Okay. Apart from that, decreased gastric HCL and pancreatic sodium bicarbonate secretion. But this action is not clinically significant. Again, raised level of carbon dioxide in the brain and lowering of the pH. So due to this sedation and elevation of seizure thresholds may take place. Apart from that, even the transportation of the carbon dioxide in the lungs and tissues. So this will also be altered by acetazolamide. But this action is again masked by the compensatory mechanism. So these are the extra renal effects. Then coming to the pharmacokinetics. As acetazolamide, it is well absorbed orally but excreted in an unchanged form in the urine. So no metabolism will take place and the duration of action is 8 to 12 hours. Coming to the uses, now as we have seen that it has a self-limiting action, right? So also it produces acidosis on prolonged use. Hypokalemia because it increases the potassium exchange with the sodium ions. So that's why acetazolamides use as a diuretic. It is not quite very popular. But its clinical uses which are followed right now, this include the glaucoma as an adjuvant uh, ocular hypotensive to reduce the intraocular tension, then to alkalinize the urine. We have seen that acetazolamide alkalinizes the urine by promoting the excretion of bicarbonate ions, right? So urine becomes alkaline. So this is helpful in the treatment of urinary tract infection or to promote the excretion of certain acidic drugs. Now why? Because acidic drugs, it is more in the ionized form in the alkaline urine. So less of it will get reabsorbed. So you can promote their excretion in case of poisoning also. Then next use is epilepsy. Now over here it is not used as a first line drug or actual anticonvulsant agent, but it is used as an adjuvant in the absence season okay, when primary drugs are not very much effective. Another use is acute mountain sickness. So this occurs at high altitudes. When you go at high altitudes, you feel a little bit uneasy, right? Because there is a lack of oxygen. So you may have breathing difficulties. You may feel nauseated over there, okay? So to prevent all these symptoms, okay? To produce a symptomatic relief or as a prophylaxis to prevent all these symptoms, uh, acetazolamide can be utilized. Then Another use is periodic paralysis. Now, uh, this condition may be precipitated due to hyperkalemia. Okay, that is increase in the potassium level. So, what we have seen that the acetazolamide, it produces hypokalemia, right? That is, it promotes the excretion of potassium from the body. So, that's how it can benefit the periodic paralysis which may be caused by hyperkalemia. Next is the adverse effects of acetazolamide. So obviously as we have seen acidosis is produced, hypokalemia, drowsiness is seen, paresthesia that is uh, the tickling, tingling and pricking sensations, fatigue or tiredness may be seen and abdominal incomplete. Okay? Apart from that hypersensitivity reactions right, fever or rashes, then a rare side effect is bone marrow depression which may be quite serious. Apart from that, it is also contraindicated in liver disease. So those patients who are suffering from liver disease, it may precipitate the hepatic coma okay, because it may interfere with the ammonia elimination. Apart from that, acidosis, this is quite commonly seen in patients who are suffering from COPD. So in such individuals also, acetazolamide should be avoided. Okay, so this to do with the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor that is acetazolamide. Now coming to the next subclass of weak diuretics or adjunctive diuretics that is potassium sparing diuretics. 
okay so these again are subdivided into two subclasses that is aldosterone antagonist where, are, where wherein there are two examples and the second subclass is again directly inhibitors of the sodium ion channels in the distal tubules and collecting those now as a result of both of these mechanisms they will result in conservation of the potassium ions indirectly and they will also produce a mild natriuresis that is they will promote the loss of sodium ions no doubt okay that is natriuresis will be produced loss of sodium in the urine and at the same time in indirectly they will also conserve the potassium what what we have seen so far whatever drugs we have discussed all of them cause the loss of potassium from the body right high ceiling diuretics even the uh, medium efficacy diuretics all of them uh, cause even carb carbonic and hydrazine inhibitors they also cause the loss of uh, potassium from the body right so all this these advantages of all these agents this can be overcome by the potassium sparing diuretic so generally this class of drugs of diuretic drugs this is used as a diuretic no doubt it's a mild diuretic but main purpose is to prevent that loss of potassium from the body which is a very important complication of the high ceiling as well as medium efficacy diuretic so that can be prevented by combining with the potassium sparing diuretics okay so coming to the first subclass that is aldosterone antagonist so first example under this is spironolactone now coming to the mechanism of action of spironolactone how it uh, acts as a diuretic plus it will prevent the loss of potassium from the body so let us see now what exactly this particular compound is it's actually a steroid which is chemically related to mineralocorticoid aldosterone aldosterone if you can recall it's a mineralocorticoid secreted by the kidneys right okay cortex of the kidney okay so aldosterone Now, what is the, now to understand the mechanism of spironolactone? Let us see what is the role of aldosterone first. Okay, it is as the name implies. These these drugs are aldosterone antagonist. Means what they will do? They will antagonize the action of aldosterone. Now, let us see what is the role of this aldosterone over here. Okay, as you can see that aldosterone it acts in the late DT and CD cells. Okay, now. in these tubular cells at these two regions within these cells are located special type of receptor known as mineralocorticoid receptor mr that is mineralocorticoid receptor within the tubular cells okay now as the name implies it's a mineralocorticoid receptor that means what will bind to it yes the mineralocorticoid will bind now which is the mineralocorticoid over here it is the aldosterone right so aldosterone it will enter the cell from the uh, ecf side this is your ecf right so from the interstitial side it will enter the cell and it will combine with this mineralocorticoid receptor so it will lead to formation of the aldosterone receptor complex now what this complex will do it will go and act in the nucleus now what type of receptor it is now it is a nuclear receptor generally it will uh, bind to the aldosterone and it will act in the nucleus and it will start producing specialized type of protein so protein synthesis is promoted by this complex which is formed after aldosterone is bound to this receptor so transcription will take place mrna will be formed and this will code for the formation of specialized type of proteins and these are known as aldosterone induced proteins aips now what are these aips or what is the function of these proteins or what type of proteins are generated okay so these proteins these are nothing but these are what is this as you can see over here this is actually a sodium channel right this protein which is formed it is inserted into the luminal membrane so here your filtrate is present right so from here the sodium ions which is present in the filtrate it will get reabsorbed so it will result in insertion of more and more sodium ion channels 
okay apart from that one more type of protein is formed right this one what is this this is a sodium potassium atps remember sodium potassium atps by whatever mechanism sodium enters inside your tubular cells it is pushed towards your ecf by this particular transporter sodium potassium atps it's a symporter which transfers one sodium ion and one potassium now potassium is just recirculated over here but whatever sodium is entering inside to the reabsorption it is taken towards the ecf from here it will go into the blood circulation okay so ultimately what aldosterone is doing it is promoting the reabsorption of sodium ions right so more and more sodium will be reabsorbed now as a result of this reabsorption of sodium indirectly potassium is getting excreted so it creates a difference in the potential across this membrane and as a result of this as a potassium ions will be moving out as the sodium enters potassium will get removed out of the cells okay so this is the mechanism of the aldosterone so this is what aldosterone is doing now let us see what spironolactol will do okay aldosterone antagonist that means what it acts as a inhibitor of the mineralocorticoid receptor so this spironolactol now it acts from the interstitial side so far we have seen that most of the drugs they act from the luminal side right they get secreted in the proximal tubule and they will travel along through the filtrate and they will act from the luminal side right but this spironolactone it acts from the interstitial side of the tubular cell so it will enter the tubular cells and it will bind to this mineralocorticoid receptor now can it stimulate it no it is a blocker of that particular mineralocorticoid receptor so it will combine with the receptor and it will inhibit the formation of the aits in the competitive manner that means it is a competitive inhibitor of what aldosterone right so when spironolactone is administered what it will do it will block this mineralocorticoid receptor but in presence of aldosterone because it is a competitive inhibitor so both of these will compete for the same receptor spironolactone like will bind with the receptor and as a result of this this receptor is blocked so what will happen aldosterone it will not be able to bind to the receptor so this complex will not be formed so further all the reactions that is the protein synthesis all of these will get inhibited so will the aips be generated no so generation of aips will also stop over here okay because of this lack of generation of the aips sodium channels will not be inserted even the sodium potassium atps generation that is also inhibited so ultimately as a result of inhibition of this mineralocorticoid receptor the sodium reabsorption it gets inhibited hence it will promote the excretion of sodium ion. Okay, so this is how it is producing the diuretic action, right? So it is it is producing the loss of sodium ions. Now, what did I tell you about the potassium excretion? As more and more sodium enters the cell, more and more potassium moves out of the cell. Now, since the sodium is not getting reabsorbed, will the potassium get secreted out? no this process also will get stopped and this is the reason why it prevents the loss of potassium from the body this is how it acts as a potassium sparing diuretic okay understood why the name potassium sparing it spares the potassium from getting excreted out at the same time it is also producing a diuretic action Okay, but it is a competitive inhibitor, so it has no effect uh, in the absence of aldosterone. So it needs the presence of aldosterone. In presence of it, it will inhibit the mineralocorticoid receptor. Okay, now though it prevents the loss of 
potassium what you can see uh, say about that celluretic effect that is the uh, excretion of the sodium it will be mild right because most of the sodium has already reabsorbed in the proximal parts because where it, the spirulo electron is acting it is acting at site 4 remember the ones which are acting at site 4 these are weak diuretic that's because most of the sodium is already absorbed in all the three sites right so this particular drug spironolactone it's a mild uh, diuretic okay but what is the advantage over here it antagonizes the potassium loss which is produced by all the other diuretic action okay so also it can uh, produce a mild natriuretic effect or it can even reverse the resistance remember the resistance which may be produced due to secondary hyperaldosteronism now because this is an aldosterone antagonist it will even prevent the refractoriness as well okay but this effect it is produced over a period of three to four days there is a delay of action now why do you think there will be a delay of action that's because it's a protein synthesis which is getting affected right so it's not a quick process which takes place so potassium sparing diuretics to produce its potassium retaining action it will need uh, around about three to four days time okay apart from that it can also increase the calcium excretion by a direct action in the renal tubules okay then coming to the pharmacokinetics oral viability is enhanced if you microfine the powder this property you all must have also studied in your pharmaceutics as well the microfine that is decrease in the particle size it will enhance the oral viability you all have already studied what is the role of the particle size solubility is improved when you decrease the particle size right so that's how oral viability it can be enhanced by microfining the powder Okay, so it can be increased up to 75 percent then binding yes it's very highly bound to plasma proteins completely metabolized in the liver and it gets converted into active metabolites and an important active metabolite which is generated is candrinone please keep in mind the name of this active metabolite okay generation of the active metabolite from an active form so spironolactone it produces the active metabolite that is candrinone which is actually responsible for half to two thirds of its action no doubt the drug is also having the same property and the metabolite is also having the same property but majority of its action it is produced by this active metabolite which is generated if you can see the t half life of the drug is just one to two hours but that of candrinone how much it is round about 18 hours so it, the most of the action which is produced is due to this active metabolite and it also undergoes enterohepatic circulation then coming to the uses of spironolactone so as we have seen that it's a weak diuretics okay so it is used in uh, combination with the other more efficacious diuretics in case of edema it is more useful in case of cirrhotic or nephrotic edema okay over here aldosterone levels are generally high so this is an advantage because your drug is an aldosterone antagonist so it will serve the purpose over here apart from that it is used to counteract the potassium loss due to thiazide and loop diuretics okay, which is a main complication of both of these classes that is it produces the loss of potassium right it produces hypokalemia so this condition can be prevented next uses in hypertension now over here also it is used mainly as an adjuvant to thiazides to prevent the hypokalemia which may be produced by thiazide so prevent that complication of thiazide so you can use the uh, spironolactone along with it then in case of congestive heart failure so you can add this to the conventional therapy in case of moderate to severe congestive heart failure as well then coming to the interactions now supposing if you give this particular drug spironolactone with potassium supplements what will happen this drug prevents the loss of potassium from the body right so it will enhance the levels of potassium in the body right so if you give additional potassium supplements what will happen dangerous hyperkalemia that is the amount of potassium in the body may increase above normal so this is the complication which can be precipitated if you give potassium supplements along with it 
Another interaction is with aspirin, which is an NSAID. So this will block the action of spironolactone. Mainly it blocks the secretion of the active metabolite, canrinone in the tubules. Okay, so that's why it can uh, inhibit the action of the spironolactone. Actually, it's active metabolite. Okay. Apart from that, if AC inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs are given, the combination, it produces more hyperkalemia. Okay. There are greater chances of this hyperkalemia being getting precipitated. Another interaction is with the digoxin, which is used in the treatment of congestive heart failure. So spironolactone can increase the levels of digoxin and toxicity may get precipitated. Then coming to the adverse effects. The side effects include mild effects such as drowsiness, ataxia that is motor incoordination, some degree of mental confusion, epigastric distress, loose motions may be produced or hirsutism that is the male pattern of hair distribution in the females or gynecomastia that is enlargement of breast or importance difficulty in conceiving or uh, menstrual irregularities may also be produced in the females. Okay. Apart from that, hyperkalemia, this is a more serious side effect which may be precipitated, especially if the patient is suffering from renal uh, inadequacy. Okay. Then acidosis also may get precipitated, especially if the patient is suffering from cirrhosis. Also ulcers may get aggravated by this particular treatment. Okay. Then second example is eplerinone. So this is a recently developed agent which is again an aldosterone antagonist but it is more selective and less likely to produce the hormonal disturbances. So just now we have seen under the adverse effects of spironolactone, gynecomastia, impotence, menstrual irregularity. All these are precipitated due to hormonal disturbances. So this can be prevented by using eplerinone because these complications are not quite serious with this particular agent. Okay? So that's how this drug is preferred for a long term use especially in case of hypertension or chronic congestive heart failure. However, of course the risk of hyperkalemia it exists, GI side effects these are same as that of spironolactone so that's how we should be careful with the use of this class of drug. Pharmacokinetics with this eplerinone, it is well absorbed orally and metabolism takes place by CYP3A4 enzyme and it is excreted in urine as well as in the feces. Okay, two thirds of it, it gets excreted in the urine and one third get excreted in the feces. T half life is 4 to 6 hours so it's a short acting drug but there are chances of interactions with inhibitors of this enzyme. Remember over here metabolizing enzyme is CYP3A4. So drugs like larithromycin or itraconazole which can inhibit this enzyme metabolism of this drug, inactivation of this drug. So no active metabolites are generated. Okay. So inactivation will be inhibited. So what will happen to the blood levels? They will remain high for a longer period of time. So toxicity may get precipitated. Whereas if you give inducers of this enzyme such as carbamazepine or rifampin, they will enhance the metabolism of this drug. So inactivation will take place at a faster rate and it may decrease the efficacy of the drug. Uses eplerinone, it is indicated in moderate to severe congestive heart failure or hypertension and in case of post infarction left ventricular dysfunction. Whereas it can also be used as an alternative to spironolactone in combination with other drugs. Okay, so this to do with the aldosterone antagonist subclass of potassium sparing diuretics. Now coming to the second subclass that is the inhibitors of renal epithelial sodium ion channels. Okay, so remember in the introduction also we have seen that there are amyloride sensitive sodium ion channels. Okay, so these, uh, these are inhibited by the these particular two agents, okay, trimeterine and amyloride. So these are non-steroidal in nature, organic bases, which can inhibit the sodium ion channels. As you can see that the name very clearly indicates what is the mechanism of action, okay. So by inhibiting these sodium ion channels, it can indirectly decrease the potassium excretion as well. 
okay so whatever sodium excretion is promoted that is matched by chloride so chloride excretion will take place and bicarbonate excretion will also take place so urine alkalinization is possible over here apart from the excretion of sodium it will also have the action on the calcium ions and magnesium ion excretion so over here the excretion is reduced now coming to the mechanism of action as we have seen the same figure which uh, we have referred for the spironolactone so in the late dtn series there are specialized sodium ion channels which promote the reabsorption of sodium ions right now these are amyloid sensitive uh, channels or renal epithelial sodium ion channels okay, through which the sodium will get reabsorbed okay. now how this particular reabsorption is taking place or why it is taking place that's because there is a electrochemical gradient any ion crosses the membrane in in case if there is a difference in the concentration right okay so this transport it takes place along the electrochemical gradient now what is responsible for maintenance of this electrochemical gradient yes it is generated by this pump so more and more sodium is pushed out so that is why there is a electrochemical gradient in this direction that's why the sodium is getting reabsorbed by this sodium ion channels okay so as the sodium ions move in a potential difference is maintained across the mineral membrane a potential difference of minus 50 volts is generated because a positive ion is moving right now because of this difference in potential it promotes the movement of potassium in the opposite direction okay now over here the transporter is different right this is not an anti porter please keep that in mind sodium is getting reabsorbed through separate set of sodium ion channels and potassium is getting secreted through separate set of potassium ion channel there is no direct coupling in between the sodium and potassium channel as such but what will happen when more and more sodium ions are entering this particular site that is at site 4 okay more the delivery of sodium more will be the entry of sodium inside the cells through this sodium ion channels more will be this depolarization right so there will be a change in potential and this will act as a driving force for the movement of potassium in the opposite direction so that's how more and more potassium is getting excreted out right so this is what is happening normally now how amyloid will act okay so it will act by inhibiting this particular sodium ion channels okay so all the diuretics which we have seen okay which acts proximally they promote the excretion of the potassium ions right but over here this particular diuretic these two diuretics amyloid and trimetrin they block this sodium ion channels as a result of this this particular potential difference is prevented and that's how the excretion of the potassium is inhibited indirectly there is as such no coupling in between these two transporters but as it prevents the reabsorption of sodium ions secretion of potassium is also prevented so more and more potassium potassium loss is prevented and sodium loss is promoted so it is having a diuretic action as well as a potassium sparing effect as well because it inhibits this sodium ion channels renal epithelial sodium ion channels that's how indirectly potassium loss is also prevented okay now in the intercalated cells of your cd there are h plus pumps also right which secrete the h plus ions into the lumen okay so this this pump is also facilitated due to the negative potential which is formed okay so amyloid as it reduces this luminal negative potential okay, 
because it is preventing the reabsorption of sodium ion. As a result of this, indirectly there is also decrease in H plus ion secretion as well. So as a result of this, acidosis will be precipitated because decrease in the H plus ion excretion is taking place, right? So it will be retained in the body. So acidosis may get precipitated. So this is one of the com complication which may be seen. Now both of these drugs, as we have seen that they act at the later site, right? So obviously these will be weak diuretics. So these are mainly used in conjunction with the thiazide type or high saline diuretics. So two, they will add to their diuretic action plus they will also prevent the hypokalemia which is a most important complication produced by these drugs. Okay. So natriuretic action, antihypertensive action will be augmented plus the adverse effects. Most important complication will also be prevented. Okay. Then the risk of hyperkalemia. Okay, this is more common because it is retaining potassium in the body, right? So this may be a complication which may be produced and that may be aggravated if you give it along with the potassium supplement. So dangerous hyperkalemia may be produced. Also we have seen in the uh, spironolactone also uh, that AC inhibitors or ARBs if they are administered, it will result in hyperkalemia, right? So combination should be avoided. Even beta blockers and NACIDs, this will also aggravate the hyperkalemia. So this should not be combined. Also the renal impairment patients, in these also hyperkalemia chances are more. Also it can elevate the levels of plasma digoxin. Okay, so both of drugs should not be combined with digoxin. So to discuss a little bit kinetic points of both the drugs, triamterine and amyloride are the two examples. So triamterine, it is incompletely absorbed oral okay so oral absorption is not very good binding to the proteins is also not extensive and largely metabolized and excreted in the urine plasma t half life it is just four hours and action lasts for six to eight hours side effects are quite mild like the, the nausea dizziness muscle cramps or rise in blood urea impaired glucose intolerance or photosensitivity, these may be seen. Next drug is amyloride. It is 10 times more potent than triamterin. Okay, so less dose is required. Okay, and at higher doses, it also inhibits the sodium reabsor reabsorption in the proximal tissues. Okay, but little clinical significance with this uh, particular action. It also decreases the calcium and magnesium excretion and it increases the urate excretion. So what you can conclude from here, hypercalcemic action of thiazide, it is augmented. Thiazides also increase the uh, calcium levels, right? Okay. So hypercalcemia, it is the same as that of thiazide because this drug is also decreasing the calcium loss. But hyperuricemia, which is produced by thiazide, this is enriched because urate excretion is increased by amyloride. Apart from that, it also has a mild antihypertensive action as well. Okay. Then coming to the kinetics part, only one fourth of this particular drug's oral dose is absorbed. So oral viability is not very good. Plasma protein binding does not take place. It is not metabolized and excreted out as it is. T half life, as you can see, it is quite longer, 20 hours and even the duration of action is also longer. Usual side effects include nausea, diarrhea and headache. So quite mild side effects. Then amyloride also blocks the entry of lithium through the sodium ion channels. Okay. So it helps in uh, the mitigation of diabetes insipidus which may be induced by lithium because the lithium uh, levels of the body are also reduced. So also when it is given in the aerosol form it can um, improve the symptoms of cystic fibrosis okay, which uh, may be produced by increase in the fluidity of the respiratory secretions okay. and the third subclass so this is to do with the potassium sparing diuretics the third subclass of weak diuretics is osmotic diuretics so examples uh, under here most commonly used example is mannitol so mannitol it is actually a non-electrolyte 
low molecular weight substance and it is pharmacologically inert okay so does not have any kind of actions in the body okay and since it is a low, low molecular weight substance it will easily get filtered through the glomerular filtration okay so when this particular substance is given it can be given in large quantities because it is pharmacology inert right pharmacologically inert so no action will be produced okay so when it is given it can raise the osmolarity of the plasma as well as the tubular fluids okay and it is not metabolized in the body so it will get as it is filtered in the kidney tubules okay so it will reach the kidney tubules or the renal tubules because it freely gets filtered at the glomerulus and also it undergoes limited reabsorption so what we have seen as the filtrate moves most of the contents gets reabsorbed right but reabsorption of this mannitol does not take place in the renal tubules so it will remain over here in the renal tubules okay it will not get reabsorbed now since it is an osmotically active substance right it what it will do it will start retaining the water in the kidney tubules right so let us see how exactly it is acting as a diuretic or a osmotic diuretic okay so first mechanism of action is that it will retain the water iso osmotically in the proximal tubule so since it is getting filtered over here very easily so it will retain it is an osmotically active substance right so it will start retaining water over here in the proximal tubules okay so it will dilute the fluid over here so this fluid when it becomes diluted what will happen now why is ions move because there is a gradient right so since the fluid is getting diluted over here okay so it will oppose the reabsorption of sodium and chloride next mechanism is that it inhibits the transport process also in the thick ascending limb of nd but the mechanism is unknown okay but uh, this is uh, quantitatively more important reason why it induces the diuresis okay another reason is that it expands the extracellular fluid volume so as a result of this gfr is increased so since gfr increases the movement of the fluids will take place at a faster rate and reabsorption rate will be reduced also it inhibits the renin release also so hemodynamic changes will also get affected another mechanism is that it increases the renal blood flow especially to the medulla okay medulla means in this region it will increase the blood flow vasa recta is supplying the blood right to the deeper regions so blood flow it increases so as a result of this the medullary hypertonicity is reduced and the cortico medullary osmotic gradient remember the osmotic gradient is maintained as you go deeper the osmolarity of this region goes on increasing so that's how the differential movement of these ions or water takes place right so this osmotic gradient is maintained due to the hairpin flow of the fluids through the loop of nd so since blood flow to this region is increased it this gradient will get disturbed which is maintained over here so this gradient will get affected and as a result of this the salt reabsorption is also reduced so this is how indirectly salt reabsorption is inhibited okay so what you can conclude from here mannitol it increases the urine volume but along with it it also increases the excretion of all the cations and all the anions that is sodium potassium calcium magnesium as well as calcium the chloride bicarbonate and phosphate ions all the ions excretion is also enhanced now one particular precaution with this particular drug which you should take is it should be given by the uh, iv route because it is not absorbed orally okay, so you need to give this drug as a 10 to 20% of uh, solution in the iv by the iv route okay then the t half life is 0.5 to 1.5 hours now uses coming to the uses 
you know, as such, mannitol, it is not preferred for the treatment of edema or it is not a basic use of mannitol to be used as a metriuretic drug. Yes, of course, it may be combined, but current uses are increased intracranial and intraocular tension. Okay. Because of its osmotic action, it will encourage the movement of water out of the brain parenchyma csf and the aqueous nerve that's how it will help in reduction in the tensions in these regions brain and the ocular tension is reduced also it can be used to maintain the gfr and urine flow especially in case of acute renal failure such as in case of shock severe trauma cardiac surgery or hemolytic reaction so also it is used to counteract the low osmolarity of the plasma in ECF because it is increasing the osmolarity, right? So it can uh, use to counteract this low osmolarity which may be due to hemodialysis or uh, peritoneal dialysis. So to prevent the decrease in osmolarity, this osmotically active substance can be given. Then the contraindications, what are the situations in which this drug is supposed to be avoided? That is acute tubular necrosis, cell death, if it, all, it has taken place. Anuria, that is total absence of urine. If there is no urine formation, you are not supposed to give this drug. Then pulmonary edema, acute left ventricular failure, congestive heart failure or cerebral hemorrhage. All of these conditions, mannitol is supposed to be avoided. Okay. Next is the side effects. Headache may be produced due to hyponatremia. This is quite common. Apart from that, nausea and vomiting and hypersensitivity reactions may take place rarely. Then another two examples are isosorbide and glycerol. So these two are orally active. In case of mannitol, we have seen that it has to be given by intravenous route. But these are orally active osmotic diuretics which may be used to reduce the intraocular or intracranial tension. So this is the main purpose for which it is used. And the glycerol, it should not be given by intravenous route. This is one precaution because it may lead to hemolysis. It has to be given by oral route only. Okay. So the important questions pertaining to this particular chapter is uh, the classification, uh, then the mechanism of actions. So a note on any of the class may be asked. A note on high feeling diuretics and loop diuretics or medium efficacy diuretics or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or potassium sparing diuretics may be asked. Okay, or uh, mechanism of action of an individual drug or complications of high ceiling and thiazide diuretics. So these are some of the important questions uh, pertaining to this particular chapter. Uh, so this is the reference for my presentation. So this finishes the diuretic drugs. Thank you for watching.